Now we're ready to talk about a two-dimensional cellular automaton. And the one we're going to look at is arguably the most famous cellular automaton of all, the game of life. And now, it, okay, so in 1970, I encourage you all to read this article. Martin Gardner published an article in Scientific American called Mathematical Games, the Fantastic Combinations of John Conway's New Solitary, solitary Game Life. So uh, this was really a thought experiment in many ways. Get out your checkerboard, get out your checkers. Uh, a, a checker on a square, uh, on a cell means one, no checker there means zero, and play this game. See what plays out. Now, Conway wasn't just doing this for fun, although it is fun uh, if you've ever tried this at home, but Conway was really trying to produce, uh, really trying to think about biological reproduction. And could a system that exhibits the properties of biological reproduction be simulated with such simple rules in a game-like way? And so Conway started with a few core principles, which are outlined nicely in this article. There should be no initial pattern for which there is a simple proof that the population can grow without limit. There should, be, there should be initial patterns, however, that apparently do grow out without limit. So in other words, there are this, this system can kind of grow out of control, but there's no way to predict or prove exactly how it's going to behave just from its initial pattern. And if you think about that, that's really Wolfram's, from the previous video, that's really Wolfram's uh, classification four, complexity, right? There is this, uh, there is this unpredictable um, growth pattern that you, that's going to come out of these simple, this simple initial state. Okay, now uh, the third principle here is there should be simple initial patterns that grow and change for a considerable period of time before coming to an end in three possible ways. Fading out completely, settling into a stable configuration, or entering an oscillating phase. So we're going to see that there's also these patterns that ultimately come to uniformity, repetition, um, or, uh, or, 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 um, uh, as well. So we're going to see that while this, this game of life will run in this kind of amoeba-like bacteria way for quite a while, it will eventually settle into a stable state. So this is kind of really interesting. Can we achieve this, again, just with squares on a grid and each square, which is we're calling a cell, has a zero or a one? So let's look at how we might define this from a systems point of view and then uh, ultimately how we would write the code to simulate this. And, and I should note, Conway was doing this you know, not only without processing, but with, without a computer, essentially. Okay, so um, let's come over here. So one of the things you remember from the one-dimensional CA, and this is kind of one of the reasons why we looked at it in this order, is that if we have this cell, here is the cell's neighborhood. It's just three cells. Myself, the, the friend to the right, and the friend to the left. Now, in a two-dimensional CA, We have something a little bit more complex going on. I don't know, <laughs> obsessively drawing grids here on the, on, the, on the board here. Okay, so let's say we're talking about this cell. What is its neighborhood? Well, we could define a cell's neighborhood in a lot of different ways. But the simplest way we could possibly think of doing it in two dimensions would be see every cell to the right or left, as well as the ones to the right, right, left, up, or down, as well as the ones diagonally. So if we count these, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine cells total. Remember, there were eight possible ways that these cells could be configured. Now, two to the ninth possible ways, uh, 512, I hope I got that right. There are 512 possible ways this cell could be configured. So we're not going to account, in a two-dimensional CA, there's not really a good reason to account for every possible outcome. We could say like, ah, there's only eight possible outcomes. The first one is a zero, the second one is a one, the third one is a zero, the fourth one is a zero, the fifth one is a one, right? I could actually do that. If I were doing all 512, we'd be here for quite a long time. So in the case of two DCAs, and boy, you want an exercise for yourself? Try to make a three-dimensional one, right? There are so many possible neighborhood configurations that we look at them in terms of generalities. And this is what the game of life approach does. It says things like this. If there's a whole lot of cells around you that are, have the state of one, you know, turn your state to zero. If there's none around you that have the state of that of the state of one, also turn your state to zero. We're going to look at generalities. If the number of neighbors that have a value of one is greater than five, is less than two, we're going to look at it in those terms. And the game of life is, is really looking at these in the terms of what we think of almost in a way of like population dynamics. So we have three key principles in the game of life. Death, birth, and what we'll call stasis, I guess. So death means we are a cell 
and our state was 1, but in the next generation, our state is going to be a 0, not a 6. Right? When do we die? <laughs> we die do from two possible uh, principles. One is overpopulation. We are crowded. There are too, I don't like lots of cells with a state of 1 around me. It's too much. I, I must die. So overpopulation means that four or more cells are alive. Uh, I don't know what I'm writing here, are alive. Now, we also die due to loneliness. We can be very sad and say that the, we, 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 can't, we can't stay alive if there's nobody to be our friend around us. So in the case of loneliness, that is one or fewer live neighbors. I'm not doing this in the most organized way here on this board, but we can see here, this is death. Death, if our state was one, we go to zero. If there's overpopulation, too many cells around us are alive or not enough cells around us are alive. Now, um, let's think about birth for a second. Birth is when our state was zero, and now we're going to be born. We're going to go from dead, zero, to alive. The only time we have birth is if we have exactly three live neighbors exactly three live neighbors. So these are the conditions by which we die, go from one to zero. This is the condition by which we go from zero to one. And I said the last principle here is stasis. In essence, what we're saying is in all other cases, state remains the same. Right? So if our state was zero and we don't have three live neighbors, we stay at zero. So if we have two live neighbors, one live neighbor, zero live neighbors, six live neighbors, we stay at zero. Right? And uh, if we if our state is one and we don't if we have two or three neighbors right it's not overpopulation or loneliness we stay alive so this is the set of rules and now you know it's interesting to think about how did Conway come up with this would you have come up with these rules how much trial and error would it have taken you with a computer obviously you can try a lot of different rules and I encourage you to try rules most of the rules that you would try with a two DCA are going to get you very boring results everything goes to one. Everything goes to zero. Nothing ever changes. But this set of rules is this kind of magical sweet spot where you get this unbelievable, almost bacteria-like, reproductive, complex, complex outcome. So let's take a look at how that works in processing. I'm not timing myself again. OK, so the example that we're looking at here is example 7.2. This is a very simple implementation of a game of life. And we're going to talk about a couple more comp things that we could add to it to make it a little bit more <laughs> difficult to program, but um, more useful, perhaps, um, as well. OK, so let's take a look at a couple things. Number one we should point out is that no longer do we have a one-dimensional array. right? We now have a two-dimensional array talking about our CA. Right? Our CA, is in, at a given generation, is a two-dimensional grid of states not a one-dimensional grid. So in this example, we have a two-dimensional array. And if you don't, are not a, a familiar with two-dimensional arrays, I will include a link um, to a tutorial on the processing website about two-dimensional arrays. OK. Now, a couple other things. We have the same, same idea here where we have a, um, a function called generate. The function called generate is where we create the next generation. And we have to compute the states for every single next generation. Now, what is the value that we need to, to calculate? Notice all of, these, um, all of these rules require us to know the total number of live neighbors. Right? We need to say, here am I, look around me. At this moment in time, how many neighbors are alive? Are there four? Are there one? Are there three? Are there two? Are there one? And depending on my state, and the combination of my state and the number of live neighbors, this is how we're going to get our results. So let's take a look at how that happens. One thing that's a little bit insane here is we have this loop going through every single cell a nested for loop for every column, for every row. We're going to do this to every cell in our, um, so every cell in our two-dimensional array. Once we get to each cell, we've got to do a little mini loop. This little mini loop is the loop that says, hey, let's look at our own little neighborhood. Right? What does that mean? Like if we're looking at this particular cell, we're going to loop through all of these cells. Right? First, we're going through every single one. And when we get to each one, this one, we look at these. This one, we look at these. And that's what this mini loop is right here. And what do we do? We add up. We start with the total number of neighbors at 0, and we add them all together. Once we know the total number of neighbors that are alive, 
We can then implement our rules. And let's see if I can, ah, I'm not uh, well prepared here. Let me, I'm just going to make this much wider so you can see it. Oh, the awkward pause. Sing to yourself about the game of life. Um, OK, so if we look at this here, we can see here are those rules. Loneliness. If I'm alive and I have less than two neighbors, my neck, new cell is zero, my new state is zero, I die. If I am alive and I have more than three neighbors, my new state is zero and I die. Loneliness over population. Birth. If I am dead and I have exactly three live neighbors, my new state is alive. Otherwise, stasis, everything stay the same. So you can see just in the little set of a conditional statement here based on what is my state, what are my neighbor, what, how many neighbors do I have alive, what is the new state. And again, the next generation then becomes the current generation. When we run this, You've all been waiting for this your whole life, the game of life. Here we go. Here is the result. And we can see we can let it just like going to go for quite some time. We can see there are these places where it reaches a static state. There are these little oscillating places where it's oscillating back and forth, back and forth. And I encourage you, if you're wondering, well, why is it doing that? Get out a piece of graph paper, get out a checkerboard, and try to calculate the generation. You know, put put four, put those four states on, and see, look at it. And why are why are the ones around it staying off? Why are the ones inside staying on? It's 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 uh, it's quite entertaining to do that. I, you know, I'm going to go have lunch in a little bit. I might you know get out some paper and do that while I'm having lunch. Um, okay. So what are some other things to say about this? A lot to say, and I'm sure I'm going to miss a bunch of things. But a couple things I want to mention. Well, one thing that's really important is that we haven't, no, in the previous video on this one, I've really left this out. We haven't talked about what to do with the edges, right? Look at, here's a one-dimensional CA, right? This cell has neighbor to the left, neighbor to the right. What do we do with this cell? It has a neighbor to the right. It has no neighbor to the left. If you notice in my examples, if we go back to the code here, I am taking a sort of license to make things very simple. I'm actually starting at column one and ending at columns minus, ending at, at the total columns minus one. Starting at row one, ending at the total rows minus one. What this allows me to do is never have to worry about the, the edges. The edges are, in a sense, staying constant. We don't calculate their, their values. Perhaps a more useful thing, right? Think about a one-dimensional CA as being a strip of paper. Tie the two ends together, and we have a um, a continuous strip of paper, right? We could say this edge is neighbor to the right is this one. It's neighbor to the left is this cell. So we could wrap around the edges. That's, and, and I have examples in, in the repository that do that as well. It makes the code look a little more confusing because I'm using the modulus operation to do that. But that's an important thing to realize. The other way you could do it is you could design different rules for the edges. You could say, well, the edge only has one neighbor, so I'm going to come up with a rule set just for the edge. But that, to me, is like unbelievably, well, you're, just, you're causing yourself so much trouble just for the edge. It's very inconvenient. So I, 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 you know, that's an interesting idea. But in my examples, I'm either ignoring the edge or doing wraparound. Um, the other thing I should just point out here, and we're going to get to this, I kind of think, in the next video, is really where, how do we go a little further with this stuff? Two obvious ways that you might think of as your own exercise, and I'll talk about them a bit more in the next video, is number one, what's the most, what's the thing that you're always looking at that you're working with, which is a, a two-dimensional grid of, of cells that have a state? Pixels. Pixels live in two-dimensional grids. They all have a state, their color. Sure, there are millions of possible colors, but black and white is just 0, 1. Grays are 0 to 255, right? All, all, just about all image processing algorithms are cellular automatas, right? A blur is just saying, take a pixel and average it with its neighbors. That's the rule for how a color changes from generation to generation if you were to apply a blur over and over again. If you look in Photoshop, there's a convolution filter which allows you to set the weights of various pixels in a neighborhood. That is a CA algorithm. There are, I've seen uh, water ripple-like effects, watercolor effects, all sorts of types of things that you could do with a CA. So one, you might think about applying this to image processing. Um, and the other thing you might think about, which I think is really important here, is the fact that these cells, they could be object oriented. Right now we have a two dimensional grid of numbers. But what if, instead of a two dimensional grid of numbers, uh, sorry, exercise. Oh no, that's not an exercise, it's an example. Example 7.3. 
What if our game of life was a two-dimensional, sorry about this, two-dimensional grid of cell objects, right? What if instead of just having two-dimensional integers, we had two-dimensional objects? Those objects could know where are they on the screen? What has been their history of states? Um, other aspects, do they move? There's so much you could do with that. And this particular scenario is very simple, but it just shows you how, in this case, what we're doing is when a state, when a cell gets a new state, it's when it goes from live to dead, it's turn, when it, when it dies, it's blue, for, it's red for a moment, when it's born, it's blue for a moment. So the fact that we could store more about a cell in, in an object is something that's going to afford you a lot of possibilities. And you can see here, all we're doing is storing each cell's location, its width, and its previous, its, um, its current state and its previous state. You know. Uh, the other thing you should really, well, I'm going to get to this, I think, in the next video, actually. Boy, I'm really screwing these up. <laughs> but, uh, this is kind of a learning exercise, and maybe I might like, re-edit these or remake them in a different order. But I want to talk through a whole lot of exercises and possibilities with CAs in the next video. So you could just keep watching if you want, or you could stop.